We've seen in the standard model that the massless vector bosons, the W3 and the B, mix together to form a massive vector, the Z boson, and also the massless photon. Now let's see how this fits in with what we already know about how light interacts with matter. Let's begin with the up quark. The up quark has charge two-thirds, so it interacts with the photon with strength two-thirds times the electric charge E. Now breaking that up into the left and the right-hand components of the up quark, there are two diagrams which are just added. So the left-handed up quark interacts with the photon, and the right-handed up quark interacts with the photon. In both cases, the strength of the interaction is two-thirds times the electric charge E. However, the photon is a combination of the B and the W3. Let's see how that works in the case of the right-handed up quark, which is a little simpler. Now, we know that the W3 just doesn't interact with right-handed particles. So the only part of the photon which actually interacts with the right-handed up is the part involving the B. The mixing angle, cos theta weak, multiplies that interaction. Now we can move that mixing angle from the B, from the field, the B, to be part of the interaction strength. That's because all of these quantities are just multiplied together. So the total interaction strength of the right-handed up with the B is given by g prime, the strength of the interaction, the cosine of the weak mixing angle, and then what we call the weak charge of the right-handed up. That's denoted by y of u r. This leads to an equation since both sides must be equal, the strength of these interactions must be equal, we learn that y u r times g prime times the cosine of the weak mixing angle must equal two thirds times the electric charge. Now, filling in the definition of the weak mixing angle, this equation takes the following form. On the right hand side, we still have two thirds times the electric charge, but now on the left-hand side we just have the interaction strength, g and g prime, and the weak charge of the right-handed up. The solution of these equations that we're going to use is that the weak charge of the right-handed up is two-thirds, and the electric charge is given by g prime g over the square root of g squared plus g prime squared. This is one way in which we see that the electromagnetic interaction is unified with the weak forces. The strength of the electromagnetic interaction is just given by a combination of the strength of the weak forces. Now let's move on to understand what happens in the case of the left-handed up quark. In this case, things are a little bit more complicated because both the B and the W3 interact with the left-handed up. So we can expand out the interaction of the left-handed up with the photon in terms of two terms. One involves the field B times the cosine of the weak mixing angle. The strength is given by the weak charge of the left-handed up, Y of UL, times the strength of the B coupling, G prime. The other term, which is simply summed, involves W3 times the sine of the weak mixing angle. As we said before, the strength of that coupling is just a half times g. Now as before, we can move the cosine of the weak mixing angle from the particle b and think of it as just part of the strength of the interaction. We could do just the same for the sine of the weak mixing angle. Now filling in the definitions of the cosine of the weak mixing angle and the sine of the weak mixing angle, we see that in both cases you just get the electric charge out. This leads to a simple equation that two-thirds times the electric charge equals the weak charge of the left-handed up times the electric charge plus a half times the electric charge. 
The solution of this is simple, and it is that the weak charge of the left handed up is one sixth. So we found that the weak charge of the left handed up is a sixth, but the weak charge of the right handed up is two thirds. The weak hypercharge of the left handed up and the right handed up are completely different. So before symmetry breaking, we should think of the left handed up and the right handed up as being simply different particles. This is true of all the fermions in the standard model. Before the electroweak symmetry is broken, their left handed components and their right handed components have nothing to do with one another. They're simply different particles. It's only after electroweak symmetry breaking that the charges of these particles, their electric charges, are equal. Then they combine and form a massive fermion. This mass also comes about through their interaction with the Higgs boson. So let's look at how matter interacts with the Higgs boson. Here we see the interaction of up quarks and down quarks with the Higgs. On the left is the interaction of the up and the Higgs. The strength of that coupling is proportional to the mass of the up quark. It's proportional to the mass of the up quark divided by the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. Notice that in this interaction, the left-handed up changes into a right-handed up. Similarly, the down quark interaction strength with the Higgs boson is proportional to the mass of the down quark. And also, left-handed down quark changes into a right-handed down quark during the interaction with the Higgs boson. Now, after electroweak symmetry breaking, the Higgs takes on its vacuum expectation value. There is still one Higgs scalar left over. That Higgs scalar interacts with up and down quarks in just the same way as the full Higgs field does prior to electroweak symmetry breaking. But there's one additional effect after symmetry breaking. That is that the Higgs takes on its vacuum expectation value. So if we plug that in, we get interactions like this. This is the kind of interaction that ties the up left and the up right together into just one up quark. The interaction is proportional to the mass of the up quark. Similarly, the left handed down and the right handed down are tied together into one particle through this interaction. The interaction strength in the case of the down quarks is proportional to the mass of the down quark. Let's look at how the fermions in the standard model behave before and after symmetry breaking. Before symmetry breaking, these are the particles. There are left-handed ups and left-handed downs that form a pair and interact with SU2. In addition, there's a right-handed up and a right-handed down. These don't interact with SU2. In addition to the quarks, there's a leptonic sector. This is comprised of a right-handed electron and another pair, the left-handed neutrino and the left-handed electron. This left-handed pair interacts with SU2, while the right-handed electron does not interact with SU2. After symmetry breaking, the left-handed up and the right-handed up pair up and become the up quark, U. In just the same way, the left-handed down and the right-handed down pair up and form the down quark, D. Again, in exactly the same way, the left-handed electron and the right-handed electron pair up and form the usual electron, E. Finally, as far as we know, there are only left-handed neutrinos in nature. So after symmetry breaking, there is a neutrino, but it's just a left-handed particle. Now, there's one further surprise in the standard model, and that's that this structure is replicated three times. So this family is just one generation of three generations in the standard model. Here are what the generations look like after symmetry breaking. The first generation is just what we talked about before. There's an up quark and a down quark. In addition, there's an electron and a neutrino. The second generation has a set of particles whose properties are exactly the same as the first generation, but they have different masses. In this generation, there are two kinds of quark, the charm quark and the strange quark. There's also a particle with the same properties as the electron. It's just heavier. We call it the muon. In addition, there's another neutrino called the muon neutrino. 
The third generation consists of the heaviest set of particles. The quarks are called the top quark, T, and the bottom quark, B. Meanwhile, there's yet another heavy copy of the electron, called the tau, and another neutrino, the tau neutrino. These particles, again, other than their mass, have exactly the same properties as the familiar up-down quarks, the electron, and the first generation neutrino. We've now learned all of the details of physics at the deepest level we currently understand it. So let's use this knowledge to understand how the Higgs boson was discovered at CERN. To do that, there are two things that we have to understand. The first is, how was the Higgs boson produced? And the second is, how did we know that a Higgs boson was produced? The key thing to understanding all of this is the statement that the Higgs boson couples to mass. We've already seen this. Before symmetry breaking, the Higgs field couples to particles in a way which is proportional to their mass. After the symmetry breaking, this coupling leads to two phenomena. The first is the particles get a mass, and the second is that the Higgs scalar interacts with particles, again, in a way which is proportional to their mass. Since the Higgs couples to mass, we need to know a little bit about what particles are heavy and what particles are light. So here's a table of the various particles in the standard model, including their mass. I'm measuring the mass in units of giga electron volts over c squared. Giga electron volts is a unit of energy, so since E equals mc squared, giga electron volts over c squared is a unit of mass. The heaviest particle in the standard model is the top quark. Its mass is 170 GeV over c squared. The next heaviest particle is the Z, which has a mass of 91 GeV over c squared. After that, there's the W boson, with a mass of 80, and the bottom quark, which is a mass of 4. The heaviest partner of the electron is the tau on. It has a mass of 1.7 GeV over c squared, which is just a little heavier than the charm quark, which is a mass of 1.2. The next heaviest particle is the muon, followed by the strange quark, the down quark, the up quark. Then we arrive at the electron. In these units, the electron mass is 0 0.00051 GeV over C squared. After the electron, the next lightest particles are the neutrinos. We haven't measured the, energy, the mass of neutrinos, but it's very light, so for our purposes, it's nearly zero. Finally, the gluon and the photon are exactly massless particles. One thing to notice about this is that there's quite a large spread in the masses of the particles. The top quark mass is about 10 to the 5 times the up quark mass. That's a factor of 100,000 in the masses. So we've seen that the top quark is the heaviest particle in the standard model. Let's use that knowledge to see how the Higgs boson is produced at the LHC. Now the LHC collides two protons. Now some protons are accelerated and brought together until they collide. Now these protons aren't elementary particles. They're composed of a bunch of other particles. So a proton consists of two ups and a down, all held together by a sea of gluons. Now these ups and downs are not the only quarks that are existing in the proton. That's because gluons are constantly splitting into other quarks. So gluons can come along and interact with a pair of quarks, which then reform a gluon. So in addition to the valence up and down quarks, there's continuously a selection of other quarks being created inside the proton. Now, if we want to create a Higgs boson by smashing together two protons, you might think that you've got to get the Higgs boson from its interactions with the ups and the downs. But that's not the most important process. 
because the Higgs interacts so much more strongly with the top quark, it's much more probable to get a Higgs boson from an interaction where a gluon has split into pairs of top quarks. And to get a Higgs boson from the interaction of the Higgs with the top quark. This interaction is much stronger. There's two reasons for that. The first is that the top quark has a large mass. It's 10 to the 5 times the mass of the up quark. But these diagrams represent amplitudes. The probability, the quantum mechanical probability of a process occurring is the square of the amplitude. So this factor of 10 to the 5 is squared. That's a factor of 10 to the 10. Now we've learned about how the Higgs is produced at the LHC. The process of Higgs production is usually called gluon fusion because two gluons are required, making a top quark, which then radiates a Higgs boson. But before we really understand the behavior of the Higgs at the LHC, we also need to know how the Higgs decays. The Higgs is not a stable particle. So at the LHC, experimentalists face the task of understanding whether a Higgs was produced based on the evidence contained in the stable particles that they are able to detect. So now let's talk a little bit about the various different kinds of Higgs decay processes. We've seen that the most important interaction between the Higgs and matter in the standard model involves the top quark. So you might think that the most important decay of the Higgs involves the Higgs falling apart into two top quarks, as shown in this picture. Now, in fact, this process is just not allowed. The reason is that there is not enough energy in the Higgs to make two tops. So the reason for that is just that the, on the left hand of this picture, we have a Higgs boson. In its rest frame, the only energy available is in the mass of the Higgs boson. So since the mass of the Higgs is 125 GV over C squared or so, the energy available on the left-hand side is 125 GeV. On the right-hand side, the top quark has a mass of about 170 GeV over C squared. So on the right, I need a mass energy of, in total, more than 340 GeV. The more than is because these two tops are in motion relative to one another. So 340 is the minimum amount of energy I would need to make these two tops. Since I just don't have enough energy, the process is forbidden. The next heaviest quark in the standard model is the bottom quark, B. It has a mass of 4 GeV over C squared. So in this picture, on the right hand side, I need a mass, I need an energy of more than 8 GeV. Since the Higgs has an energy of 125 GeV in its rest frame, this process is perfectly allowed and is in fact the most important decay process of the Higgs in the standard model. Are there any other decays of the Higgs boson other than to matter in the standard model? Well, the answer is yes. For example, we've seen that the production process of the Higgs that's most relevant to the LHC involves two gluons interacting to form a top which radiates a Higgs. Now we can just turn this picture around. Now we have a diagram where a Higgs is decaying to two gluons. This is a perfectly allowed process because gluons are exactly massless particles. In a similar way, we can have an interaction of the Higgs where it decays into two photons. Again, photons are massless, so this is perfectly allowed. Now we've seen that the Higgs can decay to the massless vector bosons in the standard model, the gluon and the photon. What about the massive vector bosons? Well, let's consider Higgs going to W plus W minus. On the left, we have available energy of 125 GeV, as usual. On the right, well, since the mass of the W is 80 GeV over C squared, I need an energy of at least 160 GeV. So you might think that this process is forbidden. However, since 160 GeV is quite close to 125 GeV, this process is allowed 
But there's a little caveat. That is that one of the W's shouldn't really be thought of as a particle. Since there isn't quite enough energy to make the particle of the W, what really happens here is that we just create some disturbance in the W field. One of the W's becomes a particle. The other one, this disturbance in the field, falls apart very quickly. But since it decays like a W, to our experimental colleagues, it looks just like a W. Similarly, we consider the decay of the Higgs to two Z bosons. Since the mass of the Z is a little larger than the mass of the W, this process is a little bit more disfavored. In addition, since there are two Ws but only one Z, this process is always at least half as important as the process with Higgs decaying to two Ws. So let's put it together and see which decays are most important. Here's a table of the various Higgs decays in their order of importance. As we said, the most important decay, in the sense of the most probable decay of the Higgs boson, is to two B quarks. The next most probable decay is to two Ws. After that, the Higgs can decay to gluons, to tauons, to two Z bosons, to two chunk quarks, and to two photons. Of course, there are more allowed decays, but these ones are the ones that are most important for understanding the Higgs at the LHC.